and welcome to another episode of Archive Deep Dive, a show where we uncover and discuss some lesser known gothic novels and texts from the dusty shelves of our spooky archives. I'm Mary and this is Lauren and we're your Ghoul Guides. You can follow us on Twitter at The Ghoul Guides um, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date with all of our latest videos. Um, okay, so today it's Lauren's turn to dive into the archives. So Lauren, what text are you going to share with us today? Okay, we are going for Clamp's Clover, um, which is one of their lesser known mangas and one of my all time favourites. So hopefully this will be an interesting one for you. I'm very excited about this one because this is the first time we have looked at a manga text. Um, so I guess with no more ado, uh, let's deep dive. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll be uh, following a kind of who, what and why structure. So let's start right at the beginning. Who made this text? <laughs> okay, so Clamp is a group of four manga artists. Um, they started in the 80s as a doshinji circle. So doshinji is um, fan manga, essentially. So lots of artists make these amazingly high quality um, fan arts essentially of popular manga. So in some cases this is to cater to a particular ship um, which is when you um, want two characters to be together in a relationship, hence ship. Um, sometimes it's just to tell stories um, but essentially they came together, it used to be a bigger group and then they started making their own original manga and um, for most of their career there has been four of them um, so they are Nanase Okawa, uh, Makona, Tsubaki Nikoi, and Satsuki Irigashi. So they are four female manga artists. And um, essentially they kind of swap roles for different mangas. So different mangas have different visual styles um, and different storytelling styles. So for a while they would use a certain setup and then they decided to like change things up and they switched to a different one. Uh, but most, mostly there's four of them. Um, they are one of the most famous and most long-running manga artists. So they've sold over a hundred million copies of their Tankobon. So Tankobon are like this. Um, so usually manga is published in chapters, it's published in um, weekly or monthly magazines, and then it's collected into these. Um, this is actually like a bumper one. Usually there's like four or five chapters for, uh, per tank bomb. So they're like huge international bestsellers. And those of you that are familiar with Japanese anime and manga probably know them from their world famous Cardcaptor Sakura. So Cardcaptor Sakura is a magical girl manga. Um, it's had a sequel, it's had a couple of animes, um, it's had voice dramas, it's recently been rebooted, and the characters, Sakura and Sharon, um, also had their own um, kind of reimagining spin off in Subasa Reservoir Chronicle, which I will probably do a bit is it gothic episode on some time because I love it so much. But one of the things that they're really famous for is very beautifully illustrated, very emotionally moving manga. And manga that is mostly aimed at girls, which we tend to call shoujo manga. Um, now, most of their manga does have a darker twist to it. Even Cardcaptor Sakura, which is in many ways the kind of epitome of a magical girl manga. Um, it's, you know, beautiful outfits. Um, you know, it's very focused around hope and love and friendship. Um, it's about a middle school girl. You know, she's, she's a young girl um, finding herself. Um, and this is kind of all tied up in this magical quest. Uh, that she goes on but it's very cute it's very endearing it's often very uplifting but it does still have a darker tone to it um the same goes for other of their famous manga like chobits which is um a manga about um life like robots so they always kind of do this sort of you know shoujo style with a with a twist to it but i think in clover you get that more than any of the others. But because it's maybe not as long or it's not as aimed at younger women, perhaps it's kind of been sort of underrated. So even though Clamp is one of the most famous, if not the most famous 
um, contemporary manga artists and manga writing groups. Uh, Clover, I think perhaps um, a lot of you might not have come across and um, it's incredibly gothic. That is, that, I mean, they sound, they sound amazing um, and so yeah. interesting. And I love, I, I mean, I always love the, the way that manga is kind of constructed in a way that, that emulates the kind of 19th century serial novel. Uh, yes. where it's serialized in a kind of yes, weekly exactly. installment and then at the end you have this kind of finished piece um so so let's get to the what then Let, let's get okay. to you know what is clover tell us a bit about the plot what makes it gothic okay so this novel is about a um in the briefest sense about a military project called the clover project um, and it's set in a world that is very dystopian, um, very Blade Runner-esque. It's unclear exactly when or where it is set. It's unclear if it's a dystopian future, if it's a fantasy universe, if it's, you know, some kind of alternate universe. We're not really, we're given a couple of place names, um, but we're not given a lot of detail. So pretty much dropped it in Medias Res. Um, there's no kind of world building, um, which works really well because this is a visual text. Um, it maybe wouldn't work as well in a novel, but because we can see elements that are familiar, mm. it kind of gives us enough of an in. It's um, really interesting. Yeah, mm. so in that sense, it's a very gothic text because you have that real uncanny feeling as a reader. Um, the style is very familiar because it's clamped. There are familiar elements. There are familiar fashions. But then at the same time, it's very different, it's very strange, it's very offsetting. So as soon as you pick it up and start reading and you're dropped right in the middle of it, you have that kind of strange feeling as a reader, which I think makes it very gothic from the beginning. And the aesthetic itself, you know, is incredibly gothic. But even just in the construction of the reader experience, as you dropped in, it's very gothic. Now, it's split into essentially four parts. Um, so the first two are about Sue, who is the clover, um, the kind of titular clover, the, the main character, so to speak. So Sue is a young girl um, of indeterminate age. We don't know if she is older than she looks. We don't know if how long she's been in this kind of greenhouse that she's been living in. But the story begins with a man called Kazuhiko. Um, and Kazuhiko, we understand, is a kind of former soldier, maybe a former secret agent. And he's called back in by um, an elderly woman who appears to be part of a council um, of wizards um, who have some kind of psychic abilities. Um, and she is like, hey, I saved your ass a bunch of times when you got court-martialed. So even though you're a civilian now, you owe me this one job. And he's kind of like, well, if you're asking me to do this job, then it must be black ops. Like, there must be some reason. So he asks, she asks him to deliver a package. And it turns out that this package is Sue. So he finds himself in this greenhouse. And the greenhouse is protected by what he calls as kill dolls. But what we see as the reader is these very cutesy Alice in Wonderland style animals. So there's, you know, a rabbit and a jacket and a bird in a jacket and, you know, this very kind of Victoriana steampunk. But he's, Kazuhiko says to himself in there by the reader, oh, well, there must be something seriously worth protecting in here because these are late model kill dolls. And you're like, oh, okay, they're not cute animal attendants they're like murder machines masquerading as Alice in Wonderland animals. Super creepy. So you start to get that impression. Yeah, you start to get the impression that something is going on here. So he meets Sue and Sue asks him, are you here to take me? And he's instantly kind of very intrigued by this young girl. She's um, obsessed with this song. Um, and you find out as the story goes on that the song is actually by his... Um, deceased girlfriend Aura um, and as it kind of plays out you realize that there's a connection between Aura and Clover um, which I won't spoil because it's really beautiful um, and the story kind of unravels and Kazuhiko has to get Sue to the fairy park and the fairy park it turns out is an adventure like a theme park 
And it's not really clear why he's got to get her there, but essentially as the story unfolds and you kind of learn more about this world, um, not loads, there's a rebel group that's led by a child. Um, there's soldiers um, that seem to have some kind of like psionic, cyberkinetic abilities. Um, Kazuhiko talks about having lost his hand in his last mission. And then you find out he has like this, it's not a prosthetic arm, it's like this kind of psionic shape-shifting battle arm, um, which is very Clamp. Clamp are known for their kind of like excessive designs and these beautiful designed weapons and things like that. Um, so yeah, this is like a high-tech society. Um, that arm sounds amazing, by the way. That so just, cool. Yeah. Like. <laughs> um, and the way that Clamp designs, it's really interesting because Clamp does this a lot where they'll have like mecha, they'll have armor, they'll have battles, you know, but it's beautifully designed. And it brings up a lot of questions about the female gaze um, and kind of this type of story written for a more female audience and less through a masculine lens, which... Um, don't have time to unpack here but I think for this it makes this a really interesting story that this is you know this is obviously an unkind world um, and that's where I kind of what leads you to the main story so the first two chapters are about Sue the next chapter is about Aura and we find out that Aura was a one leaf clover so the clovers are split into one two three and four leaf and we find out that Sue is the only four leaf there was only three three leaf clovers and then an indeterminate amount of one and two. So the ones and twos aren't that powerful, the threes and four are incredibly powerful. And the story kind of uses that in a very specific way. So the third chapter is about Aura, the singer who Kazuhiko was in love with um, and who dies. We know at the beginning that she's she passed away and how she comes into contact with Sue. And then the final chapter is about Ran, um, a three-leaf clover who makes a decision to leave the greenhouse, even knowing that um, he won't survive for long outside of it. So the story essentially becomes about these people with these powers, which are really indeterminate. It's not about their powers. Um, you would think that this would be a story about these people and their like superpowers, and it's really not. The story is about what it's like to be alone, what it's like to be in love, and why we live, essentially. So in Rand's story, which is the last story, which closes the, the text really beautifully, you know, there's this whole thing about, well, you can never understand somebody fully. You know, he has this twin brother who's the other three leaf clover, and he's like, if you leave me, no one will ever understand you. And Rand is sort of like, well, you know, I want to live, even though I might only live for five years and like my lifespan's going to be because I'm outside of here, my lifespan's going to be really shortened, like, this isn't living, like, I'm not living for any person, you know, he meets this two-leaf clover, and they start working together, and Sue is sort of interspersed, Sue and Aura and Kazuhiko, they all appear in each other's story, so all the characters are kind of interspersed between them, but what I think makes it really gothic is that in that very Radcliffian sense, it's a very intimate story about humans, and about mortality, and about emotional connections and about meaning and there's this whole running theme of who will cry for you when you're dead will there be anyone to cry for you and what do you leave behind and you know what what is you know soup has all of this power but that means she's very alone so why like you know she kind of is like well what's the purpose of me and what's the point of me so it's a very bittersweet and beautiful story in a way that I think really only manga and graphic novels and comics can kind of convey because so much is said in the artwork that doesn't need to be said. There's not a lot of dialogue in this, um, in this manga um, and there's almost no um, square boxes. So manga usually has the square boxes which are the kind of narrative boxes or the thought boxes. Um, it almost is entirely in speech boxes and then there's this song that runs through it um so it's kind of all interspaced and interspersed with this song uh which clover and aura are both sing and which ran here's on the radio um so it's a really kind of it's a real meta narrative it's a non-linear narrative 
Um, and it's just a snapshot of something that could perhaps have been a 24 volume epic, but it's just this four chapter snapshot and it's just yeah. a really beautiful gothic story. I, I, I think, yeah, I mean, it sounds super, really like super interesting. And, you know, you have all of, you've got this kind of weird robotic biokinetic arm, you've got these weird like murder dolls, you've got a apocalyptic dystopian potentially timeline but actually once you take away all of those kinds of layers and all those aesthetics and all those objects what you have is a sounds like a a, a story that you know looks at those big questions which I think is very gothic you mm -hmm. know and the aesthetic the show um uh, but what's yeah. important is is the actual kind of the human stories underneath yeah. um exactly. okay so wow what an what an interesting text I guess that leads me to my final question, which is why? Why should people read this text and, and why is it important specifically mm -hmm. from a Gothic perspective? Okay, so really the first thing, and I, you know, we, I'm sure we're gonna intersperse some, some pictures through this, but the first thing first is, <laughs> this is such a beautiful book. Um, the artwork is just absolutely fantastic. Um, Gorgeous. Anyone who's familiar with Clamp will probably know that they are, you know, just have a real beauty to their work. Um, it's very intricate. It's if you like um, fashion, um, if you're into gothic fashion, if you're into kind of cyberpunk, um, this manga is just a, a feast for the eyes. Um, so aesthetically, it's incredibly gothic. And um, it does that thing which a lot of manga does do, um, things like Black Butler do it, um, but it blends East and West really interestingly. So you have, um, so for example, the rebel group are all dressed in very Chinese traditional clothing, whereas, um, you know, the wizard elders are dressed in a more Japanese style, traditional, but kind of unfamiliar, it's all kind of traditional, but different. Uh, the agents are dressed in, you know, almost Cold War style. They've got the long coats, they've got like goggles and glasses. Um, you have that very kind of classic sci-fi look. Um, Sue wears, um, you know, a, a very kind of like magical girl set of clothing. Um, Aura has this beautiful kind of big dark curly hair, wears all of these fantastic kind of femme fatale, outfits because she's this jazz singer um there's lots of kind of imagery of wings both you know mechanic and natural so from an aesthetic just from an aesthetic perspective it's so pretty it's such a beautiful book and you know i just love to look at it it's such nice artwork um and it does you know it does kind of have that really beautiful blend of styles it's very gothic and aesthetic um, but from a visual narrative perspective, it brings that gothic storytelling to life. Um, so it does that kind of, it's more like a collection of short stories based around one thing rather than a coherent narrative. And I think that because you, because it's visual, because the character designs, you know, Kazuhiko looks slightly younger and slightly different in Aura and Ran's stories than he does in Sue's story. So we know that this is before. Um, you know, Ran is a child in his story, but he's an adult in Sue's story. So the visual aspect is more grounding, and I think it permits this kind of non-linear meta-narrative, which allows that gothic element to really come in um, just really, really well. Um, which, you know, there's a lot to be said for the way that Gothic presents in visual media. Um, and I just think as a snapshot, you know, this is a self-contained story. Um, you don't have to buy or read 35 volumes. Um, this is just, I mean, it looks big, but like, this is just a contained story. Um, so if you just want to sit down and read one story that's kind of like sitting down and reading through a glass darkly or no in a glass darkly i'm getting my titles mixed up or you know reading lovecraft country you know this is this is separate stories that at different times but in the same universe in the same timeline with the same people um so from that perspective 
um, it's really good. And it's just, it's one of those stories that like some of the kind of the best Gothic narratives kind of makes you want to be introspective without making you too sad, <laughs> which is a weird, kind of maybe a weird thing to say, but I think the thing that a lot of people love about the Gothic is the way that, and you know, to go back to Radcliffe's description of terror as something that broadens the mind, the way that this text thinks about loneliness and connections and memory and who you are and how you leave your mark on the world and what's important just in the act of living, this, I, yeah. this text does that really, really well. And you, I think you, you, you said bittersweet earlier and I think it yeah, sounds like it's exactly that. So bittersweet. Yeah, it's beautiful. Kind of, it's not too heavy, but I think because it has that gothic aesthetic, and because it uses that sort of traditional elements of gothic storytelling in this kind of new way. Um, this is, I think, like 20 years old now. Um, I would need to double check. I should have double checked the date at the beginning. I'm too used to reading academic books that put the date of publication at the beginning. They don't do that in, in these mangas. <laughs> um, but this one that I have was published as part of Clamp's 20th anniversary. So that kind of tells you how long they've been going for. Um, but yeah, this is, this is, you know, Clamp do a lot of this kind of stuff. Like RG Veda is one of their earliest mangas. It's about gods of destruction being reborn. Um, XXXholic is about a time witch and about ghosts and spirits. Um, uh, X is about the end of the world. You know, they do play with these very big, big ideas. Like they do kind of lean really heavily into those big questions of, of existential meaning and things like that. But this does it in a very intimate and very personal way um, that I think like reading I know I always talk about Radcliffe, but like reading Radcliffe, you know, you have those moments of fear and those moments that of the sublime that make, you know, your kind of throat close up and you panic for a moment and you think, well, who's going to remember me when I die? And you have that moment, but then it's that kind of very beautifully told story where it's like, well, look how this one connection between these two people gives this much meaning. And it kind of is that mirror back on. So whereas some of that earlier Gothic was kind of using that mirror to show the flaws of humanity and like you should be scared of these people. This is very sort of like a lot of post-millennial gothic. I wouldn't say it's happy gothic necessarily, but what it is doing is kind of shining that mirror onto the, the smaller points of life um, in a way that I think a lot of modern gothic stuff does. So I think it fits really, really nicely into that modern gothic canon, that embracing of the other the sort of like, well, as long as we have each other, like, then we'll have had something and that's really special and important. And I think um, it's been kind of missed out of that. And yeah, okay, maybe it doesn't have the impact of something like Evangelion, which was a huge, like, globally popular one. Um, I think it's still, I think a lot of people were really inspired by this. And I think if you are interested in that shift in the Gothic, um, kind of post 90s and it's embracing of the other, it's embracing of alternate styles, it's shift to a more global um, genre, then this is definitely one for you. Well it, it sounds fascinating but also gorgeous, it looks so gorgeous, gorgeous. <laughs> um, so I, I think I will definitely have to put it on on my list to read. Um, Good. 100%. And, and and really yeah, thank, thank you. Um, so thank you for is, such a... This is Aura and this is Ran and his brother. Um, yeah. So even if you just get it for the artwork. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Lauren, for such a fascinating uh, deep dive into your Gothic archives. Um, very welcome. And I hope that you um, watching this at home have enjoyed this as much as me. Um, we've been your girl guys. Um, Mary and Lauren. You can find us on Twitter at The Gore Guides um, and also don't forget to subscribe um, to stay up to date with all of our all of our videos um, and until next time stay safe and stay spooky.